The case featured in this episode has been researched using police records, court documents, witness statements, and the news. Listener discretion is advised. All parties mentioned are innocent until proven guilty, and all opinions are my own. Hey everyone, my name is Nikki Young, and this is Serial Napper, the true crime podcast for naps. I'm back with another true crime story to lull you to sleep, or perhaps give you nightmares. In March of 2022, married couple Eric and Corey Richens were celebrating at their Utah home. Corey, who was a real estate agent, had closed on a house that she had planned to flip for her business. They put their three young boys to bed. And then they had a few drinks, including a Moscow mule that Corey made for Eric to enjoy in bed. The couple then fell asleep, with Eric sleeping in the master bedroom and Corey sleeping in one of the boys' rooms because he often had night terrors. Around 3 a.m., the child woke up from a nightmare. According to Corey, she soothed him back to sleep, and then she returned to her bedroom, where she found Eric unresponsive at the foot of their bed. In a panic, she called 911. However, it was too late and he was pronounced deceased at the scene. It was a really shocking situation. Eric had not even turned 40 years old yet. And he was a healthy young man. I'm gonna say young because I'm almost 40. An autopsy revealed that he had died from a fentanyl overdose and his wife believed that he may have consumed a fentanyl-laced gummy. The family was devastated, particularly their young children, who were only between five and nine years old when their father passed. About a year after his death, Corey published a children's book called Are You With Me?, which she had written in collaboration with their three sons. It was said to be a book written to, quote, create peace and comfort for children who have lost a loved one. Corey promoted the book on her local news station speaking about the grief that her children had experienced and how she hoped this book would help other children to process their own grief. Which is why you can imagine the shock felt amongst their family and community when Corey Richens was arrested and charged with her husband Eric's murder in May of 2023. So dim the lights, put your phone down, and listen to the story of Corey Richens, the woman who once wrote a book to help her children process the death of their father, but who now stands accused of his murder. So, let's jump right in. Eric Richens was many things. He was a family man, a good old country boy, and a seriously successful entrepreneur. He had a lot going for him. Born to his parents, Gene and Linda, on May 13, 1982, he grew up in Bountiful, Utah on his family's cattle ranch meaning he learned from an early age the definition of a hard day's work. As the eldest child, he spent much of his time helping his father to feed the horses and cows and to keep up with the property. But above all else, he kept a watchful eye on his younger sisters, taking the role of big brother very seriously. In school, Eric was an athlete who played all kinds of sports, including baseball, soccer, and running cross country. Once he had graduated, he devoted much of his time to coaching and mentoring other young boys. In his free time, which he had very little of, he loved anything and everything that he could do outdoors, like hunting, four-wheeling, and snowmobiling. It's hard to imagine with such a jam-packed schedule that he'd also be able to lead a successful career. But he did that too. Eric graduated from the University of Utah in international studies, and then he built a highly successful masonry business. He was known to be a well-respected business partner and boss who built close relationships with everyone he worked with. He truly built his business from the ground up, and the more success that he achieved, the more he wanted to help others achieve that same kind of success. It's just the kind of person that he was, larger than life. 
As you can imagine, people gravitated towards Eric, and there was no shortage of young ladies who might fancy him. He married his first wife, Julie Jorgensen, in 2005. According to those who knew her, Julie was said to be one of the prettiest girls at school. Eric and Julie had a lot in common. They were both physically active and always on the go, enjoying sports like soccer and baseball and skiing. Unfortunately, it was a whirlwind romance that didn't last too long, and the couple ended up divorcing just four years later in 2009. It was said to be kind of a messy divorce, with Eric getting the short end of the stick financially as his assets were divided between the two. Nobody gets into a marriage thinking that they'll ever get divorced and have to give up half of what they've worked for, but it was a difficult lesson that Eric wouldn't forget. Just a few years after the divorce was finalized, Eric's ex-wife Julie would tragically die in a horrific car crash. While she was sitting at a red light, she was rear-ended by a pickup truck that crashed into her going 70 miles per hour or around 113 kilometers per hour. The driver was under the influence of marijuana, and because it happened on a frosty January day, his windshield was covered in frost, and he just didn't bother to wait for it to defrost. The driver was actually sent to prison, and though Eric and Julie weren't together at the time, it was a tragedy that broke his heart, one of many to come. A few years later, Eric found himself having a bit of a crush on a cashier named Corey, who worked at their local Home Depot. With his stone masonry business, he was in the store a lot. He practically lived there. Everyone who worked at the store knew Eric by name, and he was a well-liked customer. According to another Home Depot employee named Linda King, he'd always walk into the store with a big smile on his face. Linda would say, quote, You could never forget his laugh. I loved that laugh so much. He would come into my line all the time. When Linda noticed the way that Eric would look at Corey, another cashier, she told him that he should find the courage to go and talk to her. Eventually, he did, striking up a conversation with her while she worked the cash register. He was said to be too nervous to ask for her phone number directly, so he had a friend do it, and eventually he asked her out on a date. Corey was a pretty brunette who was about six or seven years younger than Eric. She was still very much trying to figure out what she wanted to do with her life and just starting to make plans for her future career. But she admired Eric's ambition and dedication to running his own successful business. She really looked up to him. The two were inseparable from the day that they met, and Corey's brother would later say that Eric fit perfectly into their family. Eric was good for Corey. She had a lot of dreams and goals, but Eric showed her that truly anything was possible if she put in the hard work. While they were dating, Corey enrolled at Weber State University, working towards a Bachelor of Science in Healthcare Administration. Life was really good for the couple, who in 2012 moved into this beautiful, enormous home in the town of Francis, Utah. This mansion was an absolute dream. Five bedrooms, four bathrooms, valued at more than $1.1 million, and purchased by Eric, who was now earning around $1 million a year in revenue from his company. About a year later, on June 15th, 2013, Eric and Corey would tie the knot in the backyard of this incredible property. Before saying their vows, Corey agreed to sign a prenuptial agreement that stated if they were to divorce, she would not be entitled to any money made from his business. At the time, Eric's business was worth approximately $2.5 million and quickly growing. The couple agreed that if they were to divorce, neither of them would be able to lay claim to any of each other's present or future income and assets. However, Corey would be entitled to some of his assets including her husband's partnership interest, if he were to die before her during their marriage. After losing half of his estate in his last divorce, Eric thought that this was the right move, but he had no idea that this prenuptial agreement could be a motive for his demise. Of course, 
At the time, he wasn't thinking about any of that. He believed that he had found the love of his life, and they were looking at building a future together. This future included having three sons, Carter, Ashton, and Weston. According to those who knew him, Eric's greatest achievement in life was being a father. The boys idolized him just as much as he idolized them. Corey and Eric built a beautiful life together, with Eric thriving in his business and Corey starting her own real estate company where she would flip houses for profit. They traveled the world together, and truly they seemed like the couple that had it all. But things were not always as they appeared. As early as 2015, Corey began having financial troubles within her real estate business. She wanted to move houses faster than her profits would allow, so it's alleged that she began to take money from Eric to continue buying and flipping homes. Eric was aware of some of the money that she was taking, but at times it's alleged she did things behind his back, even forging his signature. In March 2019, it's alleged that Corey opened a revolving line of credit with Eric as the co-signer, and she forged his signature. She borrowed approximately $250,000 in his name. She forged paperwork, assigning her power of attorney over Eric's affairs. And then she spent $30,000 on his credit cards and withdrew another $100,000 from his bank accounts. In total, it's alleged that Corey stole approximately $494,000 of Eric's money. We're not talking pocket change, and I'm not sure how Corey thought that she would continue to do this under the radar. Maybe she thought it would be better to ask for forgiveness instead of permission. Eventually, Eric did learn all about the money that was being spent on his cards and in his name while he was at an appointment with the bank, and he confronted Corey about it. She promised to pay it all back as soon as she had flipped the homes and made a profit. But that day would never come. Things were getting really tense in their marriage, and it didn't help that there were rumors swirling around town that Corey was having an affair. There wasn't any concrete proof, just small town whispers, not enough for anyone to actually step in and tell Eric about it especially because they had three little ones to worry about and they didn't want to break up a family. Then something really odd happened that alarmed Eric and it made him suspicious of his wife's intentions. While they were on a family vacation in Greece, he called his sister and he told her that he had become violently ill after drinking an alcoholic beverage that Corey had made him. He went as far as to say on the phone that he thought that Corey may have poisoned him. He didn't want to believe that she could do such a thing, but he couldn't escape the idea that maybe his wife was trying to kill him. Maybe he was worth more to her dead than alive. In October 2020, he decided that it was time to consult a divorce lawyer and an estate planning lawyer. Without telling Corey, he changed his will. He created a living trust, and he gave his sister, Katie Richens Benson, control of his estate. He changed the beneficiary of his $500,000 life insurance policy from his wife to the trust, and he transferred his 50% business partnership interest to the trust. Meaning, if anything were to happen to him, everything would go to this trust, not his wife, and his sister, Katie, would be in control of it. Eric wasn't asking for a divorce just yet but he was making plans to ensure that his children would be taken care of. Above all else, he just wanted his boys to be okay, no matter what happened. While Corey continued to spiral into debt to the tune of more than $3.1 million, Eric's business continued to grow to around $5 million. He had everything to lose, and his marriage was continuing to fall apart. Eric and Corey would constantly argue about finances and whether or not they should be together for the boys. While their marriage appeared to be coming to an end, things dragged out longer than they should have, and Corey kind of appeared to become desperate. On Valentine's Day 2022, she made her husband a romantic meal, a sandwich, which she placed on the seat of his truck along with a love note. But when Eric ate the sandwich, 
He immediately broke out in hives and he couldn't breathe. In a panic, he ran into their home and he grabbed their son's EpiPen to use. Once again, Eric confided in a friend about what had happened and how he believed that Corey was trying to intentionally poison him. Why he would eat anything that this woman cooked for him kind of baffles me. Maybe he thought that he was just being paranoid about the drink in Greece. Maybe it was wishful thinking that his wife wanted to fix things between them and this was a romantic gesture. Maybe he should have listened to that little voice in the back of his head, screaming that something didn't feel right. Less than a month later, on March 3rd, 2022, the couple would put their three boys down to bed and then have a few drinks. According to Corey, they were celebrating the closing of a home that she had just purchased for $2 million, which she had planned to flip for profit. Other family members would later disagree with this statement, instead saying that Eric, he had actually disagreed with buying this property, and he was telling Corey that she shouldn't buy it. Either way, Corey said that she made her husband a Moscow mule and brought it up to him in bed. He drank it and then he took a THC gummy, which he often did when he wanted to relax at the end of the day or get a good night's sleep. Then she went to sleep in one of their boys' rooms because he often suffered from night terrors. According to Corey, she was woken up at around 3 a.m. because her son had a nightmare. She calmed the child down and then she walked into her master bedroom to climb into her own bed. And that's when she says she found her husband, Eric, unresponsive at the foot of the bed. Corey called 911, and she was instructed on how to perform CPR, which she would say that she attempted. When emergency services arrived on the scene, they noted that Eric was bleeding from his mouth, and they didn't believe that Corey had actually performed CPR because she didn't have any blood on her. Eric was pronounced dead at the scene. How did this healthy, active 39-year-old man suddenly die in the middle of the night? An autopsy would provide insight, but it would also lead to more questions and answers. Eric had more than five times the lethal amount of fentanyl in his system when he died. He had died from an overdose. But how did the fentanyl get into Eric's system? Corey had a possible explanation. Eric had taken a THC gummy that evening, which he often did, but he didn't always get his gummies from the most reputable of people. It was possible that the gummy he had taken that evening was actually laced with illegal fentanyl and that he had accidentally overdosed. Just a tragic accident. His family, and especially his three young children, were devastated. They they were broken. Eric's obituary read, quote, Words can't describe the loneliness and loss that is felt in every heart that was lucky enough to know him. We all need to learn from Eric's example and be sure to make the time to have fun and do what we love. Thank you, Rico, for being such an inspiration and role model for us all. We love you, Eric, with all our hearts and more. Eric's family wasn't so sure about this explanation involving the gummy and the fentanyl. It just didn't make sense to them. Eric wasn't a heavy drug user. Sure, he enjoyed THC gummies, which he bought frequently. But the idea that this time he got one that was laced with illegal fentanyl, not even the medical grade, it just didn't sit right with them. Just 48 hours after his death, a battle of truth and power would be waged between Eric's family and his wife, Corey. There were several family members, including Eric's sister, Katie, who decided to spend the night at the Richens family home following Eric's death. According to Corey, she asked if they could leave so that she could have time alone and begin the grieving process. However, Katie refused, insisting that Corey did not own the home, which was in Eric's name alone, and that she would be kicked out of it soon enough. Allegedly, Corey hired a locksmith to come to the home and drill into Eric's safe, which had over $125,000 in cash in it. Eric's sister Katie stepped in to tell her to leave the safe alone because she was no longer in charge of his estate. And according to police reports, that's when Corey became angry and actually punched Katie in the face and the neck, resulting in the sheriff's office being called. It was a tense, emotional situation, 
with Corey learning that she was no longer in control of her husband's estate and that he had removed her from everything behind her back. This would be the beginning of a battle to see who would truly benefit from Eric's business dealings and life insurance policies. In February 2023, Corey filed a claim against Eric's trust, contesting Eric's sister as being the one in control of the estate. She stated that the terms of their prenup should still stand, that in the event of Eric's death, if they were still married, she would be entitled to a percentage of his assets. In her claim, she reported that it was both her and Eric who purchased the large mansion together, stating that she had also financially contributed to the down payment as well as the monthly mortgage payments. This has been a claim that Eric's sister Katie has disputed all along, asserting that Corey did not make any contribution to the home, which was purchased prior to their marriage. She also asked the court to dismiss Corey's claims due to the suspicious way in which her brother died. And it's true. The police, they were investigating Eric's death further. They believed that it might be more than just an accidental overdose. While Eric's estate was battled over through the courts, Corey decided to write a children's book called Are You With Me? which inside the cover says is dedicated to, quote, my amazing husband and a wonderful father. It was posted for sale on Amazon, and the description of the book said to create peace and comfort for children who have lost a loved one. Corey would promote her new book on several local media outlets, including ABC4 News, where she said, quote, It completely took us all by shock. We have three little boys, 10, 9, and 6, and my kids and I kind of wrote this book on the different emotions and grieving processes that we've experienced in the last year. I went on Amazon and Barnes and Noble to try to find something to help us cope at night. Nights are the hardest. I just wanted some story to read my kids at night, and I couldn't find anything that suited them. So I was like, let's just write one. So you actually wrote this book with your children. I did. Mm -hmm. And it's only been a year. How did you process and say you th go from processing death to I need to write a book and help others? You know, I just watched the struggle that my kids were going through. And I actually, you know, I went on Amazon and Barnes and & Noble and trying to find something that we could use to cope at nights. Nights are the hardest, it seems like, for everybody when, you know, dealing with anything. But I just wanted some story to read to my kids at night. And I just could not find anything. I couldn't find anything that really, you know, suited them or helped them find comfort and peace. And so, you know, I was like, let's just write one. The book is no longer available on Amazon, and that likely has to do with the fact that shortly after the release of this book, Corey Richens was arrested for aggravated murder and three counts of possession of drugs with intent to distribute. Prosecutors believe that Corey killed her husband Eric for financial gain, believing that she was entitled to his estate after his passing. She was well over $1 million in debt from her business dealings and already planning a new future with the man that she had been carrying on an affair with. Corey has pled not guilty to all of these charges, including additional charges that have since been brought against her, including attempted aggravated murder and fraud. It was revealed that in January 2022, just months before his death, Corey had logged into Eric's $2 million life insurance policy and altered it. The original beneficiary on this policy was Eric's business partner, but Corey changed it to make her the only beneficiary without authorization. Eric was alerted to this change, and luckily he was able to change it back before his death. However, just one month later, Corey applied for a new $100,000 life insurance policy on Eric without his knowledge. The motive was evident. Corey was deeply in debt, and she wouldn't get a single penny, as per the prenup agreement, if they were divorced. However, she would receive a sizable sum if Eric were to die while they were still married. That is, if Eric hadn't become suspicious of her behavior and changed his policies to make his sister the distributor of his assets. After Eric's death, a search warrant was executed which included Corey's phone, 
and several computers that were located in the home. These devices contained a treasure trove of information that would help the prosecution to build their case. Investigators found a slew of messages between Corey and a housekeeper named Carmen Lauber, where Corey was making arrangements to purchase fentanyl on three separate occasions. When the police interviewed Lauber, she confirmed that she had sold Corey as many as 90 pain and fentanyl pills beginning in January 2022, just before the event that happened on Valentine's Day when Eric thought that she had poisoned him with that sandwich. Just 12 days after this alleged failed attempt, messages were found from Corey asking to purchase something stronger, quote, some of the Michael Jackson stuff. And there were many more incriminating messages. Although Corey had attempted to delete her text messages from the night her husband died, there were some that were recovered. She was found to regularly text message a man named Robert Grossman, who investigators believed was the guy that she was having an affair with. Grossman had worked as a handyman on repair jobs at the homes that Corey would flip, so they worked very closely together. They spent a ton of time together, and Corey was able to use that as an excuse to go see this guy. She would just say she was working on her homes. One of the messages that was recovered was a photo that Corey had sent him showing two people kissing and a caption that said, I love you. This was sent just shortly before it's alleged she made that drink that would ultimately kill her husband, Eric. Unfortunately, there are many other key messages on her phone that may never be recovered. Corey also claimed that her phone had remained plugged in in her bedroom that evening. But when investigators reviewed movement on the phone, it showed that it had been locked and unlocked several times and that messages were exchanged, messages that have been lost forever, unfortunately. There were also several searches made from her device that the prosecution says supports their theory, including what is a lethal dose of fentanyl? Luxury prisons for the rich in America. Death certificate says pending. Will life insurance still pay? Can cops force you to do a lie detector test? How to permanently delete information from an iPhone remotely? Corey's defense attorney says that these searches mean absolutely nothing. She was simply researching her case out of curiosity just to see how evidence is processed. And I guess I kind of understand that. I mean, if somebody were to confiscate my phone now and look at all of the searches that I've conducted, I look like a very guilty person who has done a lot of bad things. But it's for research purposes. At least I have a true crime podcast to prove it. While it was debated whether or not the prosecution would seek the death penalty, an announcement was made last year that after consulting Eric's family, they will not seek the death penalty. Instead, if Corey is found guilty, it would be punishable with 25 years to life in prison, which in my opinion is a much worse sentence. In September of last year, while sitting behind bars, something interesting was found in Corey Richen's cell, and there's been a lot of debate over what it means. It's known as the walk the dog letter, which is exactly what it says at the top of the note. Some believe the note is instructions to her family on how they should testify in court, which is considered witness tampering. The letter, written by Corey, instructs her mother to get her brother to say that Eric got the drugs that killed him in Mexico. Now, obviously, this looks like witness tampering, which is what the prosecutors allege. But Corey's defense team actually claims that this isn't a letter at all. No, it's part of a fictional mystery book that Corey was writing about being imprisoned in Mexico. Do with that information what you will, but the defense tried to have her case dismissed on this basis, citing that she wouldn't receive a fair trial now that the Walk the Dog letter had been released to the public. Thankfully, that was denied, and the trial will move forward. In May of this year, Corey released her first public statement since her arrest. She once again claimed to be innocent of all charges, and she also asked for the world to give her a chance. Her trial, which will be judged by jury, is set for April of 2025, so this is still very much an ongoing case and one that I'm going to be following closely. The real tragedy here is that 
there is a strong possibility that Eric and Corey's three boys will ultimately lose both of their parents if their mother is convicted. They're currently being raised by family members and shielded from all of this as best as possible, but one day, when they're older, they're going to have the chance to read all the allegations and how even their father believed that their mother was trying to kill him. But they'll also read about how, despite it all, he tried to protect them and to set them up financially for the future. So what about that book, Are You With Me?, which depicts Eric as an angel who is watching over his young sons after his death. It's now believed that the book, it could have been an attempt by Corey to cover up her motive and actions and true feelings about his death. Which, if true, might be one of the most twisted things that Corey has done to date. To profit off of your children's pain and then to paint yourself as a victim when you are in fact the perpetrator and source of that pain, it's sickening. But let me know what you think. That's it for me tonight. If you want to reach out, you can find me on Facebook at Serial Napper. You can find my audio on Apple or Spotify or wherever you listen to podcasts. I post all of my episodes in video format over on YouTube, so go check it out. And if you're watching on YouTube, I'd love if you can give me a thumbs up and subscribe. I'm over on X, formerly known as Twitter, at Serial underscore Napper, and I post things on TikTok. Serial Napper Nick, and that's all one word. Until next time, sweet dreams, stay kind, especially in the comments. Bye.